we actually pulled out in Halifax a bunch of documents of my family. A family history? Yeah, in other words, because uh, all immigrants were, were recorded and documented quite well. Uh, the Canadian equivalent of Ellis Island uh, is, is the point of entry where ships come into in Halifax, Canada, which is a pretty far e eastern part of Canada. <clears throat> and uh, uh, one excursion with uh, my sister, with siblings, uh, we, oh, and my brother Alan and his wife, so the, the three siblings and wives, we took a cruise from Boston to Montreal and went around uh, the uh, eastern part of Canada and it went down the Solange River and we stopped in, oh, before the Solange River, we stopped in Halifax where all the records were kept of immigrants. And we were able to track down some of our relatives that came in through Halifax, which was, of course, an interesting experience. Where did they come in from, from Maryland? Well, I, I don't know what point of departure in Europe, mm -hmm. because my, uh, <clears throat> both my mother and father's families uh, come from uh, Eastern Europe, yeah. Poland. We do have some relatives from France, but I think the, the French relatives, <clears throat> their history also goes back to Poland. And uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure, but uh, the ship may have actually left from London, England. So the question was getting from Europe to London and then getting on the ship across the Atlantic. Was that a popular point of, because it, it does make sense to me, like, because Poland's landlocked, of course, you'd have to go to the coast. It's right. interesting they'd go through London and then, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, <clears throat> and who was that? You said it was your, your grandfather <coughs> who was the first to come to Canada? <coughs> the first to come, <coughs> well, there were several relatives, uh, but the most direct lineage to, to, to my father, <clears throat> my father's father, he was running away from Poland <clears throat> because at that time, Poland was under Russia and uh, he ran away to avoid the Russian army. Yeah. Very funny uh, side note, we wound up in Canada and my grandfather no was telling me <laughs> Because as we discussed earlier, it was uh, the time of the First World War. Right. And <clears throat> they were trying, there were recruiting stations in Montreal, which is the city of entry for my grandfather. I mean, that's where he settled. There were uh, boots set up to attract Canadians and immigrants to join the Canadian Army. <laughs> And they're offering him beer to entice him. And my grandfather would say, <laughs> it's really funny, he said, I ran away from, to avoid the Russian army and you expect me to join this army? Yeah, right? for some beer. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a beer drinker. Yeah. But so I don't know what the, what the well, he obviously didn't join the army, but, uh, but that's all I know about that part of the story. And that was the army, Canada's army for the First World War. And of course later, my uh, father came and mother came. Uh, they were still in Poland. So. Yeah, I, again, for, uh, the or origin or was Eastern Poland. Yeah. The origin was Poland. And uh, I don't know which way it went. Uh, I think at first uh, his father was at the train station in Montreal to greet him and didn't recognize it. Of course, my father was very young. I mean, so we're talking like maybe uh, nine, 10 years old when his father left. And, uh, and now this is five, six, seven years later. Totally you changed yeah. quite a bit in, in that age span. That's crazy. So he was at, he was at 
home in Europe with uh, his mother, I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, with, when your grandfather came, he left uh, your grandfather. He left his whole and, family, his right? wife and children. Was that common, like to send money back, kind of, to, yeah, to root yourself in it and then kind of bring your family over after things? Now, of course, on my mother's side, it's a, it's a totally different story. Her parents did not want to leave. And uh, unfortunately, they lost their lives during the Holocaust, which was in the 40s, late 30s, 40s. But that's a different story. So I'm a, I'm a childhood of, of immigrants, which makes me more sensitive when questions of immigration and, and immigrants into the United States, which we've had, again, I know it's not meant to be, and I'm not going to make it political, but uh, through, through the avenue of politics, you've been hearing a lot about immigration. So uh, technically, I'm an immigrant mm -hmm. because I was born and raised in Canada, and I went through the usual paperwork to get a visa, green card, and eventually citizenship in the United States. But I somehow have this mixed feeling. On the one hand, I'm technically an immigrant. Yeah. I was born in a foreign country, went through all the paperwork to, 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 to get into the country, stay legally in the country, and eventually become a citizen in this country. But Canada, I think, is so different from any other country because we speak the same language as Americans. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> So did the British, but I, I want <laughs> to stress that uh, uh, now, now here there's a fine line between whether there's an accent difference or not, depending of course which words are used and pronounced. Yeah. But to, uh, well, by the way, today, these are many generations later, the, 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 whatever difference exists, it seems to have kind of almost melted away. It's dissipated, yeah. But I'll give you one example. Uh, a Canadian uh, would, would pronounce, I can't even know if I can still do it, but uh, the word A-B-O-U-T has a distinctive, about. yeah, a boat. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can do it, I've been living here too long. I, I noticed that, like when I would visit um, uh, Jonathan them in, uh, in Canada, they yeah. have, they say like the door and the aboot, and yeah. they've got like the <laughs> afflection, but you've, you've lost it. Clearly. I hear less and less of it these days in the last 10, 20 years, that, and of course my first came here many years ago. Uh, but aside from a couple of words, uh, most of the most of the talk would sound very close uh, to any American talk. Yeah, I'm sure it's like um, <laughs> uh, the American accent is very southern. When other countries will, you know, they'll do like a southern accent to kind of make fun of Americans. That seems to be right. Like not every part of Canada sound you speak with that. Well, I've I've traveled across the country and I've been to Western Canada several times, but I must admit I don't detect. Or that's me. A difference between you know, a, a Canadian from the western part compared to something from the central or eastern part of the southern country. Opposite. Unlike the United States, where you, you mentioned southern, southern accent, the drawls, and, and, and people from New England for car, they yeah. say car, <laughs> car. <laughs> sure. So there, there are local differences. It's not as much as the serious now. Now, except for one thing, mm. now, I, I was born and raised in Quebec, French -speaking which is Canada. French, yeah. mostly French speaking. And what year was that event when you were? Hmm? What year were you born in Quebec? I'm sorry. What year were you born in, uh, in Quebec? Well, then I was born 1932 in in, uh, in the city of Montreal in the English speaking part. So all my schooling was done in English. However, in Quebec, I don't know about the rest of Canada, but in Quebec, from grade three on, you're obliged to learn French. You have no choice. 
So we were given one day, one hour a day, that was five days a week, right up through college, I would say, not college, but high school. You could continue in college if you choose, but it's not mandatory, but high school, yes. Yeah. And so, uh, because of the interwoven aspect of French, so some Canadians might develop a little bit of an accent that resembles uh, or influence, I say, by the French-speaking part of, of, of uh, that they were all exposed to. And by the way, that's another crazy thing. The French we were taught in school was usually uh, the teachers would speak, would teach us the way French is taught in France, and there's a big accent difference between the local French that I was exposed to, I mean, on the streets, outside the classroom, and, and the French spoken in, in France. <laughs> so it, 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 I, I, I kind of laughed to myself, why force to teach French so we can speak to the local French people when, when, when the accent is so different and it's on, <laughs> And some of the words are different, just like the English language. Yeah. We have like English in England has different, um, like the elevator lift. and li yeah. lift, for example. When we call a subway in the United States, they call it the underground, you know, in England. Subway means something different in England than it does in the United States. So uh, we have all, all this interwoven aspects of uh, language. But that, that's my upbringing. And uh, coming, coming to California, where, where I spent most of my American life. But first you went to, you went to school at McGill, right? Mm -hmm. You went to McGill University? Well, that's college, of course. Or, yeah, I mean, if you want to get into the, what yeah. brought me here, which I guess is part of my history, mm -hmm. I, I got the, both a bachelor's and master's degree from McGill University in Montreal. And it's, it's one of the top acclaimed universities in, in the country, if not the world, by the way. They're extremely well, worldly known in medicine because they've had some uh, world famous uh, doctors on staff at McGill University. And, and your uncle had actually spent a month at uh, med school in, at McGill University. He did? I didn't know that. You didn't know that? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, he, uh, after graduating from USC here, he, uh, he went to, uh, he was looking for a med school, and his first choice, I came to learn, was UCLA. <laughs> he was put on a waiting list at UCLA. In the meantime, he got this offer from McGill plus a few other Amer schools in the United States. And he decided to take the one from McGill. So he decided kind of doing things reversed to me. I started McGill, wound up at USC. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I, I, I should take us back to where, where it brought me here. Yeah. So it, to go on for a PhD, the question was, um, what school should I go to? One of the professors, no, in fact, at McGill, when I was doing my master's, he said to me, what are your plans after your master's? So I said, I'll go on for a PhD. I had no doubt about that. And he said to me, that's fine. Oh, no, and he says, and, and where will you go for a PhD? I said, most likely here at McGill University. Excellent. Which really, which was an honest answer. I mean, that's how I felt. Yeah. So the professor said to me, well, that's fine if that's what you are. Of course, if you stay here, you'll hear the same old stuff from us old fogies, <laughs> they put it. And boy, did that light uh, up something for me. And I said, well, you know, you, you're absolutely right. So I started thinking, I should go to another university. Should I go to another one in Canada? I said, what the hell, if I'm leaving home, why not try a different country, like the United States? So I applied for teaching assistantships to a number of universities, all in the United States, and I got an offer from the University of Southern California, USC. 
which I took, and that's what brought me over here. Uh, did you ever move back after attending mm -hmm. USC? Or did you live here basically once you had gone to school at USC? You'll have to speak up a little bit. Oh, um, when you went to USC for school, did you ever move back to Canada after, or did you stay in? No, th th that's a very good question. Uh, in the first year or two, my plan was to, to go back to Canada when I got my, through my schooling. But as the years went by, I became to know a lot of people, and especially uh, people that wound up in the aerospace industry, which was doing very, very well at the time I was getting near the end of my schooling. And uh, I felt that I mean, Canada didn't have anything really attractive to offer me, other than a government job, etc. So I decided that I better stay, and wound up in aerospace. As after that, I started off with a company that their one fellow graduate student recommended I talk to people. A small company in Pasadena called Electro Optical Systems. And they, they liked me a lot for a strong reason that the research I was doing was using electronic components that were very similar to what one of the projects that the electro optical systems was working on. And what year was this? I was having difficulty with the earth physicist and they, were, they learned about my background. They were anxious to talk to me. And I was told that they want to talk to you. And the rest was history, so uh, I uh, succeeded uh, with their project because of my background. And uh, one thing leads to another. So after a few years, oh, in addition to all this, and especially uh, tying back into the uh, immigration aspect, one of my colleagues in the physics department at USC wound up in aerospace, as many graduates did, but he became the head of the space physics division at a, a large company called TRW. They're, they're all over the country, throughout the world. Involved heavily in spacecraft. And this is about the time when, when the space program was starting to take off. 60s, somewhere around there. And he, and he said to me he couldn't hire me because I was a Canadian citizen. And, oh, wow, so they wouldn't. Uh, and uh, for, uh, most of their projects were classified. That's so so funny. that's uh, I went to Electro Optical Systems. After about uh, two and a, yeah, about two and a half years later, I got a call from my friend. And he said to me on the phone, he said, you know, we're getting NASA contracts now. NASA, so again, because of the, the Sputnik, you see, all, all this happened on time. Space Ru Russia's first space shot Sputnik. And, uh, and from that, of course, the United States had to gear up for space uh, effort. And NASA was created. Now, NASA is uh, new, not new, well, it's a good word. But, but NASA is non-military. There's nothing classified about what they were doing. Of course, the Air Force had a lot of, Tierno uh, had a lot of Air Force classified contracts. Mm -hmm. And so my friend called me and he says, hi, uh, I can now hire you because we have uh, uh, cla non-classified work that yeah. went through NASA. And so, uh, so I went down for an interview, and then he said to me, I don't have to interview you, I know you very well, <laughs> but this way we both get a free dinner. Not a bad deal. <laughs> but he had to go through the, through the, through the motions. Yeah. And of course I got hired. Oh, I had to sign a document that uh, when I'm eligible to become a citizen, that I, I will go through the process. And I was planning to become a citizen anyway. Yeah. So that was no problem. This probably helped you along. <laughs> oh, he worked for NASA. So I did, I did get secret clearance. I did get secret. 
There are three levels, by the way. The lowest is confidential. The middle is secret. That's what I got. <clears throat> so, and the top one is called top secret. Makes sense. <laughs> so very few people get the top. Yeah. Because for top secret, you have to have a need to know wh whatever projects uh, that you might come across. And so very few people are in that position. So it, it, most of us, including myself, got secret clues. And I, I did attend uh, several sec uh, conferences where secret stuff was being discussed. Like, for example, using lasers as a weapon. Now, I, I did some work with laser, electrical systems, but it was all non-military. Yeah. It was basic research. At this time, Grandpa, were you working hmm? for NASA, or were you working for a no, company no, no. that was contracted? No, no, no. The way the aerospace industry worked, they got government contracts. Right. Uh, of course, many other industries. And uh, the contracts from the Air Force always had classified because of the military interest. But NASA being a civilian, non-military organization, all their work was open to the public. So uh, even though I got, I was able to be hired by TRW because they were doing non-classified work, yeah. I still had to go through the process of getting secret clearance in case, in case I put on a project that, that has classified status. And I'll tell you something what's interesting. So in order to get secret clearance, I was, what's were vetted, is it probably? Yeah, vetted, yeah. They're vetted by the FBI. They went actually into Canada, into Montreal, and talked to my neighbors. Really? So they want to see your They want to know what they say. <laughs> Hopefully, he said good things about me. Well, apparently, they did. Yeah. Well, I do have a clean past. I, I'm positive about that. Not on my father's side. My mother's side. Uh, she lost some uh, her her a couple of siblings and her parents were murdered by the Nazis. And I'm sure Einstein would have been murdered, killed Certainly. if he had yeah. not left Europe. You see. There, there, there were a few other, uh, see my background of course in physics, and I actually studied nuclear physics in college. But I never really did anything in nuclear physics uh, professionally. But it turned, it turned out where the opportunities were, <coughs> were uh, in optical physics, uh, space physics, you know, et cetera. And, uh, which, which didn't bother me because uh, I felt I had a broad background and able to, to uh, take whatever task I was given. But uh, <clears throat> the, the, I've read many stories over the years about, uh, we are talking about Einstein, that uh, the, the people around him uh, knew, of course, how valuable he was. And there was a lot of uh, maneuvering going on in Europe to get him, and, uh, I don't know if Sweden was one of the stopping points. Sweden was neutral during the Second World War. So a lot of uh, J Jewish scientists were uh, ushered off away from Europe across the, was the Baltic, uh, and I'm not sure what the waterway is. It sounds right, but yeah, the water between in the, north. the top of Europe to Sweden. Yeah, so I get, get to, to, to Sweden, etc. Uh, another famous, German um, physicist was a guy named Heisenberg. He didn't reach the, quite the level of Einstein, but he was not far below. Yeah. So uh, he was involved with the, the team as well, wasn't he? Or? There was a lot of talk. Uh, I've been reading some of the literature about Heisenberg. I mean, he, 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 he was a giant like Einstein above the physicist. And uh, he was in charge of the German, the Nazi uh, effort to get the atomic bomb. Of course, uh, they never got it and we did. And the question is, uh, that was raised, 
Was it because we had smarter people <laughs> or because Heisenberg was not really, didn't have, he was not a Nazi by heart. Yeah, and so he may have slowed down uh, all the work that he was doing, etc. So there's there's a lot of side notes about people. Of course, being German, he didn't have to flee, so he didn't become a refugee like Einstein did. Yeah. But they didn't uh, believe in the but a lot of these guys, as you pointed out, a lot of these people on the Manhattan Project were refugees. Had to flee. Any questions about? By the way, an another thing, a subtle thing, you could tell a name. Tuesday is the miracle way of saying it. Canadians say Tuesday. Tuesday. It's very close. Tuesday. That's, you know. that's almost what British, the British say Tuesday, I guess. Well, that, that, you <laughs> see, uh, I, 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 okay, as, sure. as, as, as uh, one would well expect that I'm influenced. First of all, obviously by American culture, because we're so close to the United States, there's a common background, of course, England. Yeah. But, uh, but on television, most of the programs are American-made, you know, American actors, you know, et cetera. Not just for Canada, this can be true for a lot of other countries, because a lot of people around the world watch American programs. Yeah. Okay. No, a friend of mine that I met in Los Angeles, from Toronto, another Canadian. And we're talking about a lot of these things that we have just talked about. Yeah. He said to me, when I went to visit Montreal, still in Canada, I felt I was going into a foreign country. When I moved to Los Angeles, I found no difference whatsoever. So coming, you, you echo that a bit? You feel the same way? What's that? you feel a similar way? Like, when you came to L.A., did you notice a big change? Oh, you mean when I had that feeling? Yeah, did you have that, did you have that no, feeling? No, uh, because most of the words, except for these few little subtle things we talked about, that makes a distinction, distinctive Canadian accent, most of the words are pronounced pretty much the same. Uh, I didn't feel I had to make much of an adaption. The O.U., of course, I well, it's only how it stood out. <laughs> Outside of language, though, culturally, did you yeah. see a big difference? Or was yeah, because, oh, you're a Canadian, people would say to me, but after about a year or so, no, no, I haven't heard that thing said Because the all. accent goes, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but even culturally, there really is no significant difference. Now, for a French-Canadian, he would find a big difference when he came down there. But... Uh, but for, for English-speaking Canadian, for, especially in Quebec, I, I didn't, well, the rest of Canada is even more closer to the United States, I would say, in my experience. So I didn't find uh, any really adjustments uh, or adaptions to go through, even in my first year. I've always felt Canada and America are probably two of the most similar countries. Culturally, they don't have too many differences. It's almost like, they're an extension of each other. Uh, yeah, people talk about Canada as the 51st state. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Uh, when you go oh, and, all, and also there's uh, so many American companies in Canada. Today it's, even, it's, it, it's more widespread, but, but back in my youth, it wasn't quite like the way it is today. Have you gone, when was the last time you were back in Canada? I used to go back at least once a year, once twice a year, year but, uh, no, no, but these days I don't travel much, so it's been at least uh, four years since I've been back there. Yeah. What your friend said about when he went back, he noticed differences immediately. Did you have that after living in California for so long? Did you ever go back and think, wow, I'm in a foreign country? <laughs> I have to laugh because in the early this years, is really different. Yeah. those Canadian accents were really... <laughs> <laughs> you can hear it. <laughs> I haven't been hearing it, you see. Yeah. Uh, and I got so adapted uh, to speaking more closer and closer. Although I, I was once, to, I don't know if accused is the right word, but something pointed out uh, at work that I sounded like somebody from Detroit. From Detroit? <laughs> yeah, which is the United States. It's like an, it upper, it's like an upper Midwest yeah, accent. Yeah. Yeah. First, I've been, I've been accused of that. So, uh, 
coming back to the main topic of, of uh, immigrants, or when uh, whenever the issue comes up, I, I feel very peculiar because on one hand, yes, I'm an immigrant, but I don't feel like I'm an immigrant. Yeah, you feel natural. Well, you've been here so long. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I, I said, it just just occurred to me on uh, one of the television shows. Uh, it's an Italian family, yeah. And I can relate to a lot of the cultures of the Italian family. I just feel there's a lot of overlap with my own background, but it shows a scene of, of a child. Uh, in the United States, of course, but uh, whose father's working with the child. <laughs> I think I think he's trying to teach him uh, to talk about English, yeah. and he speaks in this very thick Italian accent. <laughs> and he says, "It worked for me." He says, "Your English would not be as good or something." <laughs> he, I mean, he spoke with English, but yeah. with a heavy accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was so fun. Canadian accent's not as thick. <laughs> it's not as, it's not as obstructive. No, but so, some American accents are, are more extreme, I think. Mm -hmm. Like especially from the South. Uh, very extreme. Or yeah. here's something else that's, that I found very interesting in my travels. In the, in the, around Washington D.C., into Virginia, the, the, there's a, especially in the Virginia side. I was in a restaurant and I heard a woman speaking, and she sounded a little bit like a Canadian. And and I and I, I don't think it was I don't think she was Canadian. She was local. Because because uh, of the British influence. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, England left its mark <laughs> in some of these little pockets. Uh, around the country, the uh, there's a lot of oh so yeah let me get back to the the French influence. So I mentioned that in in the classroom, the object that forces us to, to have French classes is so we can communicate with the French Canadians. Yeah. Really, and, and by the way. Montreal is two thirds French, and Quebec, the overall province, is probably ninety-five percent French. 95. So, uh, so, so I was la kind of laughing at myself. Why in the world they tell us teach us French the Parisian way? We call Parisian French when it's not going to help in communicating with the, the Canadian French. Right. <laughs> but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Because uh, I can communicate better with with Keats' uh, in-laws, yeah. Sandrine's parents, from France, sure. Because the French they forced on me is the French that they speak. <laughs> well, it's good to learn. I mean, it's almost like a slang. It's it's kind of it's always interesting when you're learning a language that's kind of like a like if you were to learn Spanish in Mexico, it'd be different than yeah. Spanish from Spain. But I don't know how different, and I'm sure you can still communicate with French-speaking Canadians, because, or at least you could at the time, because you lived there and you just. Well, let me tell you something. I, I got I got kind of trapped in Spanish. I was always fascinated with the Spanish language from, from the day I first heard the the accent or or the sound of the Spanish sound. Yeah. So when I went when I entered McGill. I took a lot of physics classes, but we, we, we had one option, pick whatever you want from a list. And I signed up for a Spanish class because I really want to learn the language. And uh, it turned out, I, I guess like the United States, I think you need a minimum of 15 or something for the class to go. And they couldn't get enough uh, registrants, mm -hmm. enough people signed up. So they dropped the class. I never learned it. But uh, years later in the United States, I had the opportunity to, uh, to learn Spanish. In fact, what happened was uh, 
they had a program where the uh, it, it was it was off campus at the community colleges, and I was at I, I, I think Harvard Junior College it, it was one of them, and they offered Spanish classes at the high school uh, up in Palos Verdes, where your dad was was raised, yeah. and. Uh, and, I, and it was free. And I said, what the hell, it's free? It's five minutes from the house, if ever. So I signed up and I took, I wound up eventually five semesters of Spanish. But anyway, um, so whenever I was a Spanish speaker, I tried to show it I could speak some Spanish. <laughs> so anyway, I was on a trip to um, uh, Costa Rica with a couple of friends of ours. And we were staying at a bed breakfast. And my friend had to go to the bathroom. And the, only, the owner who spoke English was not on, on site. But there was a cleaning woman there, because she spoke nothing but Spanish. So he said, he said to me, gee, see, he didn't know I knew Spanish. Yeah. But he said that he needs to find the bathroom. Maybe I can look around or help him out. So I tried to use my Spanish. Now a fellow worker had told me that he was from Colombia. Mm. And he said, and he told me that Colombia, a bathroom is excusado. So that's all I remembered. So I, so I saw the cleaning one. I said to, I said to her, donde esta el excusado? She gives me a stare like I'm talking Span uh, German. <laughs> so then it dawned on me that uh, Mexicans don't use the word excusado. Yeah. Baño is what. Oh, and I had to remember, then it came to me. As soon as I said, Donde esta el baño, she right away <laughs> led, led us to where the bathroom was. <laughs> Over the years, uh, I knew we had what's called a French branch of our family tree. Mm. Originally, it goes back to Poland, but, but for a couple of generations, I think the, the, a lot of these kids grew up in, in, in France. And uh, I, I was having a discussion. I wanted my kids going back to Montreal. So some of my Canadian relatives cousins. We're talking about our family, the extended family. And we got on something of the French. Uh, see, my mother used to write to a cousin of hers that was French. Yeah. And uh, so, I, so, I, so we, I was talking to my Canadian cousin about, about the, the, this particular branch member. And she, came, she said that she went through the Canadian Red Cross and they gave her a name and an address, which uh, which I took back, oh, so when I got back to California, I sat down to write a letter in French, since I have, I have a partial French background. Sure. So I wrote in French to this address, no response. Now would you believe 11 years goes by you get the letter? and I get a response. Wow, <laughs> 11 years? So of course, one big question is, why did it take so long to get a response? The answer is that the letter went to the right address, but the person's name was not living at that address. Mm -hmm. She got married and went somewhere else. Yeah. And her parents, who had lived there, uh, oh, they had moved to Paris. From the first address was far from Paris. Anyway, the the father, the, I guess the mother, her mother. Uh, the mother had passed away, then the father had passed away. The father of the person that I wrote to, by the way. So she and her husband 
went up to Paris to empty out the apartment. There were boxes with books and who knows what. And when she took the books off the shelf and, and, and put them over where she could carry them off, my letter fell out of a book, unopened. Wow. And that was quite wow. a story. So I remember coming home from work one day, and Bobby, your grandmother, yeah. was saying, you know, you got an interesting letter with a French stamp. And actually, it was a five-page letter with the family tree and photographs. And anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I, they, they, they take contact, or we communicate back and forth yeah. with this cousin. She's got a first cousin, I don't know if you met her, Connie, who lives in Santa Barbara. I don't think I met Connie. You don't know? I just saw her last week, by the way. She oh, came by. She? Connie's mother and the mother of the one I wrote to were sisters. Connie's mother, of course, raised in France, French. Uh, after the end of the Second World War, there was an American soldier who was walking by, and I, I skip all the gory details, but he made contact with Connie's mother. So they eventually got married, but he was from Minnesota, and, and, uh, and he said to his bride that uh, if you want me to stay in France, I'll be more than glad to say that she wants to get out of France. So he took it to Minnesota, where Connie was born and raised, by the way.